All right, everybody, welcome to today's show. Thank you so much for being here. We are going to be talking all about the new DOL ruling, the final rule, the final update. A 14-year quest has come to uh, maybe a supposed conclusion at this point. We're going to unpack all of that, what it means, um, our opinions on that, and uh, dive deep. I've got Miss Lindsay Thorne here from our uh, new business team, our contracting team, to talk a lot about how we've uh, gotten to this point and, and of course, what it means to advisors out in the space of financial or retirement planning. So, Lindsay, thank you so much for doing this yet again. Well, you did this last time with uh, the new DOL ruling back, what, two years ago, three years ago? Yes, two. Well, at the time, two years, three years ago. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Flies. Yeah. And so now we've come out with what they're calling the final rule. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so maybe do a quick summary of maybe the history of all this, and then maybe we can unpack a little bit of what this means today as far as clearer definitions of who's going to be affected by this and what everybody else needs to know. Yeah, absolutely. And 14 years is correct. It's kind of crazy to think that the quest of redefining what a fiduciary is has been a 14-year dragged out saga that all of us are unfortunately all too painfully aware of. It was DOL 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. We are at the final, hopefully final ruling is what they're calling it. Um, you think they did that on purpose? You think they did that? Call it the final rule so that nobody else will tamper with this. Right, going I forward. know this, this is, is it. it. Well, done. you know, it, I mean, they tampered. It'd be them do, tampering with their own rule. I think somebody at their office was like, "I don't want to do this anymore." The Department of Labor and just said, "This is it. This is the final ruling." But, um, yeah, April twenty third of uh this year, this year twenty four, mm-hmm. and it had a very short um, what do they call it? commentary period? It was November to April. So, I mean, that is, that's a short period of time. They were kind of done with feedback, I think, at this point. They knew what they wanted. They had to do it, but it wasn't enough for there really to be a um, a war over it again. But it seemed like it was more, this time around, just let's, we didn't feel like we did a good job of defining what the, who would be wrapped up in this. And so this felt more like we're just going to more clearly define this so that, Everybody can stop their comments and stop their questions. Probably everybody sending letters back then, probably like, wait, but what about this circumstance? What about this one? Right. Yeah. And so I feel like this one maybe didn't need the commenting period. It's like, sure. All of you <laughs> are covered you. by we this. We heard you. Here's the final ruling. Sure. Um, and not a lot has changed. You should sure, right. correct. They really were just trying to hone in on the areas that, unfortunately, they kind of. The last DOL ruling, they just kind of slid it in. No one really saw it coming. It was right at the end of, like, end of an administration. No one really thought it was going to go through, and it caught everyone off guard, but they did it quickly on purpose. But then it left a lot to be said for what they what they pushed through. So it kind of was one of those weird things where it was so underdefined that now they're just kind of going back and playing cleanup more than they're really changing much. Right, right, right. So... The good news is that means not a lot changes for the advisors out there in the field moving ERISA money. It really is a cleanup job. Right. Nothing that they're currently doing is going to shift substantially. It's the same forms. It's going to be the same care. All, all that really is same the requirements same. of the advisor. This was more like let me loop in who is is yes. under this rule and what a recommendation is. You know, like so what can be defined as a recommendation. Yeah. They close the loopholes for people yeah. kind of poking holes on it. They're like, ah, we hear you, we see you, and here's our final ruling, and we're going to go ahead and button those things up. But the biggest thing for me that I walked away understanding is simply that it used to be where ERISA money was moving to defined how you were looking if you're a fiduciary or not. And now it's simply, are you moving ERISA money, period. They don't, it doesn't matter where it ends up. They're just like, hey, it's... If you okay, touch their right. ERISA money, you're now they cared considered about the a fiduciary. Two. No, it's just about the from. Mm-hmm. Well, now it's just that if you touch it. So if you touch it, if it comes from, I mm-hmm. mean, ERISA money, yes, yes, yes. then then hey, we don't care where it's going. And that's that's a big shift from people that shift. have been doing this for 30, 40 years and their entire career. You have a mindset and understanding. It's just, ah, oh, here's how it's going to work. And then kind of, I don't know, officially the last couple of years it shifted to, no, no. Put your hands on on those ERISA funds. 
you're now going to be held to be a fiduciary standard, whether or not you like it or not. Yeah. And there's we have decision trees, and I can get you one if you want it, explaining all the which ways you could not be a fiduciary in some circumstances, but it's so gray. It's not worth rolling the dice. Sure. Just get the form yeah. and call it a day. Yeah. You know what I mean? So why don't we define a little bit just what what the forms were like what were what were the requirements if you fell into the the I'm giving advice on an ERISA uh, asset then what did I then need to do let's talk about that and then we'll talk about what's the recommendation look like and who all got looped into this new thing as as their definitions now exist Jerry yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it used to be a, a there was a big thing that people leaned on with being considered fiduciary was one if you were security licensed or not that was the most obvious well, let's, let's you know, skip but, that part let's skip that part let's just go to what I mean, what do I need to do I'm a fiduciary and I made a recommendation on oh the paper an ERISA. what do I need to do it? yeah so I mean that's going to depend on what your licenses actually you do hold so if you are insurance only um you're still going to be using the PTE 8424 form which you already have been using for two years now it is a slightly edited and we can go into that later but right now if you are licensed only for insurance the PTE 8424 form is what allows you to get paid on moving ERISA-based funds as a fiduciary. It's not It's not the opposite. A lot of people think it's the opposite. It's you're not allowed to be paid on those funds unless you get this exemption, which is so that form is actually a good thing. Oddly enough, people look at it as another piece of paper, but it is the money that allows you to uh, not have that conflict of interest because you're disclosing that you're getting paid for your time. While common sense, we all know that the world is disclosed, disclosed, because disclose because i mean look what happened with the mcdonald's hot coffee the lady sued over the hot coffee because it wasn't a disclosure because she wasn't told it was, was going to be a hot coffee <laughs> it wasn't gonna be that and, hot. and i mean so that's kind of what i'm well that's right. what this is disclose 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 it's not that it's not obvious or common sense but you just have to do one more piece of paper so what do i need to disclose the pte 8424 tells me i have to disclose all reasonable compensation mm-hmm. So, and it's not, and direct and indirect, right? So I'm supposed to label everything yeah. that I get compensated. What does that mean? Thank you for actually bringing that up because I wasn't going to bring it up till later, but this is perfect timing. I just want to know what I'm going to fill list out everything. as everything. Just right. said disclose, disclose, disclose. Right. Please put everything you think could maybe be considered compensation and that's something that people were not doing and that's why they explicitly line item that because- they put it down, you have to do it. And if you don't do it, that's when they can come at you. So it's just worth adding an extra line. And a couple things I've told folks, the percentage you're making is a given. But that little section that says other compensation, and it just leaves a blank, right in there, you may maybe may go on a trip from a carrier partner, depending on, you can just put, you know, the year, whatever. It can be very generic. Mm-hmm. Uh, additional compensation. If it's, deemed, if it's deemed an incentive trip, though, you know, and I think a lot of carriers have gotten away from like it's not an yeah. incentive trip. This yeah. is a training. It has nothing to do with your commission. Absolutely. You know, so yeah. be keep that in mind. What about like uh, marketing commissions, that marketing is, dollars? It is something they're going to want you to say now, but it doesn't have to be anything more than I am receiving additional compensation from a partner. Or I may, I love that I may receive additional compensation above and beyond the commission listed above. Yeah. As deemed appropriate. Why not? Because yeah. you might you may not get yeah. that year in tier bonus. You may or may not get yeah, some yeah. marketing dollars if to I don't put qualify. it on everything. Right. right. And then you're covered because God forbid at the time you didn't put it on that one let's say that's the one client complaint you got in your entire career mm. they go back through and now they're digging on every single thing and that's the one time that they prove that you received a, a a kickback from an imo or you received an extra tiered bonus for hitting certain premiums with a carrier but that those are often down the line right. so but you would still be held responsible for receiving that compensation and now this is the one i need everyone to lean in close They are actually making it where you may have to go back in and make adjustments if things change. So if you were to get additional compensation or qualify for a trip or any of that good stuff, it's great stuff. Technically, you need to update that client. 
who wants to call their client six months later? And this is where there's a lot of gray area right now. And I hear a lot of discussion around it. It sounds like it is still up in the air. But what does that violation of the exemption look like? Is right. it what if you get punishment? something later right. do you, and they're like, yeah, we expect you to go back to the client and amend that paper. Why? So just put it in there up front so you don't have to worry about it later. And I think we've got a number of ancillary notes for anybody that has concerns on what or how to disclose it to the client. So what you need to put down is, you know, pretty black and white at this point. I feel like maybe there's a tiny bit of gray there, but the how you disclose it, how you explain these things really matters. And that's something that we do a lot of coaching on and teaching on how to say these things. Uh, to a client. But here's what I found really interesting in an article I was reading. The, the, in the PTE 8424, the insurer, so the company, the carrier, mm -hmm. also must conduct a retrospective review of each independent producer at least annually. At least annually, they must review, and, and it's designed to detect, prevent, and prevent violations of and achieve compliance with the conditions of impartial conduct standards. Okay, so are we gonna? So we're gonna get kind of audited by insurance carriers every year for these forms at this point. Yeah, uh, it's not just the forms. Um, there's the biggest shift. Um, let me rephrase that. One of the biggest changes I've seen out of everything, because like we said, the forms are really not going to change much. Mm -hmm. But the responsibility yeah. of carrier partners and even IMOs is kind of arguably in there. But that was not something that was originally talked about. And in fact, that was in response to people bringing up, hey, well, who's going to police this? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they're not a regulatory body. Right. They can't investigate and find much like our SEC or the you know even our NAIC partners or the state insurance commissioners yeah. that have that authority. So if the DOL doesn't have that authority, who's going to police this? Well, it kind of mm, backfired a little bit because now they're actually pointing a finger and saying we're going to expect it to be the insurance carrier. And that was not part of the original. I think remember a couple of years ago here when everyone wasn't sure if that form was going to be collected yeah. by the insurance company. We had our new business team kind of on high alert. Almost every carrier opted out. There is some that said, no, we want it. We want that for our records. But the reason they opted out, Alex, is once you receive something, you're responsible for the information on it and the accuracy. So uh, one of our carrier partners did collect this information. Are they on the hook for checking that that mm -hmm. matches the agent's compensation levels that they have on their contracting? You know what I mean? Like I see people checking off the boxes that they, they sell annuities and they forget to check the box life insurance. Happens a lot. Or... And again, these are very small things, but now they will actually become policed. And so in addition to just the forms being potentially now collected, um, the biggest thing I think we might see is um, background checks being run by advisors there was, more frequently there was than what I was the gonna initial get contracting. They always run background. But if you're but if you're already contracted, they often just Leave you alone, you over, right? Leave you alone. It's not a big deal. Now, now I think it that's seems almost change. annually you're going to get reanalyzed mm -hmm. or there's going to be some. And I'll be interested to see because a lot of carriers took more of a reactive approach. If we get a complaint from a client yeah. and they file some sort of fiduciary argument against one of our contracted employees, mm -hmm. an advisor, i.e. an advisor, we would then pursue some sort of audit on that person. Now it seems they're going to have to take a pre pre or proactive approach. Yeah. And so I'll be interested, like, what does that mean for them? I don't know exactly. I think nobody's really defined that yet on, on how they're going to conduct those annual uh, audits on whether the advisor's acting in the best interest or, or holding true to the PTE 8424. Are they doing the right disclosures? Have they disclosed all that information to their clients? I was really kind of shocked in the fine print to see that there and be like, oh, nobody seems to be talking about this enough um, because I just know there are so many advisors out there that have gotten some sort of uh, ding on their record somewhere. The carrier is completely unaware of it because the carrier hasn't inspected that at, at all in a yeah. long time. And potentially they're going to have to write a, I mean, it might not be damning and, and no. you know, kick them out, but it, 
it be an LOE or, you know, some sort of explanation of how this happened, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm 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 actually pleasantly surprised that you you saw that because a lot of folks haven't really been paying attention to how it's going to impact the carrier side because we're so focused on our advisors and how their business is going to run. But that is a big thing that I think we're going to see the administration costs for our carrier partners go up. I don't know what that's going to look like. Contracting is going to slow down, likely. I got an idea. They're going to go. I got through. an idea how oh, it's going to go. Do. They're okay. going to they're going to reduce commissions. I guarantee. I, I almost guarantee. <laughs> Com- go, well, I'm just taking a I'm taking a leaf from the 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 or I'm taking not. this is a guess. Let me just clarify that. Let me just tell you this is a hypothetical, just a random thought. I kind of as reading that is the BD side forever has claimed you know a certain percentage of their fee that they collect on top of the advisor that managed the assets or you know got the assets and for compliance reasons. And to pay compliance people. And yeah. to be fair, the insurance carriers have probably incorporated some of their profit margins to be allocated towards compliance as well. But how am I not to perceive that if they now have to hire some sort of auditing force mm-hmm. to audit this new regulation, they're going to have to include that in. To, they're going to have to make up. They're not going to skip their margins yeah. to do it. I didn't want to say it. I don't want to put it out in the universe, but I mean, that is a It's either reduce commissions or reduce product effectiveness. And you might see both. You might see a little bit in each bucket. They take a little bit back from the client, a little bit back from the agent. But nonetheless, all of these things, as soon as you add more administration, I know because I run all those teams that do all the admin work. That is, if you have an efficient team, it doesn't matter if you still have more steps to do and more clients to hit, right? Like there's, there's just a numbers game here. And when we see things get backed up on, you know, processing new business or even with just contracting, some carriers are slower than others for the amount of people they put into those administrative roles and the value they see in how quickly you turn things around. But now we're going to see potentially overnight. And well, I mean, let's be real. We have one year phase in. So September 23rd of this year, one year to 2025 will be the phase in. So, I mean, we have a little bit of time to figure it out, but I do anticipate if they don't hire more people... They're going to have to. They're going to slow down. Or they will not be, me- or they'll find some other way to pass liability on to maybe the hierarchy, uh, like the IMO side of it. I don't know. But it seems as though the insurer, I mean, that's as plain as it gets. They're I mean, there's the- only one <laughs> in that relationship, they're right? They're on the hook for, on the hook it. for it. it. explicitly said about the auditing, like you said, and the timeline and what frequency. And, you know, you know that they randomize it right now, right? It's not like they don't audit. At all. at all it's just going to go from but randomized but it, it okay let me just read that one section okay. just one more time it says it says the insurer must conduct retrospective review of each independent producer each ind- so everybody there's no exception to it and it's as plain as the legalese gets mm-hmm. you know so uh, i just thought that was real shocking now okay Go ahead. What though? You know, the other thing we might actually see happen is likely that the carriers may go through. You know how every couple years they'll clean house on advisors who got contracted and then maybe just didn't write anything for what's the standard eighteen months or whatever. They might go through and clean house and just be like, because we're on the hook for reviewing and going through all these people. If you run a background, that costs money, right? So they might go through their their carrier or their carrier. They might go through their agent list and be like. Anyone that hasn't written in 18 months, we're terming for now. Lack of production happens all the time. And there might be a shift in a advisor or just-in-time status. If you're not going to send us business, we're not going to appoint you. Yeah. Because, and again, we have many carriers that do that now yeah. for business model. They don't want to spend the money paying the state to appoint you and then pay the person to do all that work yeah. if they're not going to see business. But now I that's think a really they good might thought. change yeah. and really actually do that. that. So That's probably exactly what they'll do. Yeah, I'm giving all the carriers their solutions. I'm going to get a phone call right, later. Gonna, <laughs> gonna, you're going to sign up for the advisory board. There you go. All right, so let's... T- the, okay, so that, these are the things that we have to do as producers in uh, a situation when we have been deemed in a recommendation. You know, we are a fiduciary and we are have recommended something. Now, what does it mean to be a fiduciary? So what qualifies me as a fiduciary under the new final rule? And what qualifies as a recommendation? Gotcha. That's what we got to unpack. Uh, well, I mean, there's a ton 
ton of commentary on this, and I'd like to just go through two two talking points on this, mm. make it as simple as I can, because I will send you guys all of the compliance webinars that you want to watch if you really want to, or I can say, just consider yourself a fiduciary and call it a day. There's a decision tree I can send you where it's like, if you do this and it's more than once and if it's ongoing and you, we all know that they're basically boiling it down to, it, again, I can cover the, the definition I'd love to, but it is if you are touching that ERISA money, just wrap yourself into fiduciary because there's no point splitting hairs on something that would jeopardize your livelihood. It's just not worth it. Um, and, and now they're saying that if you talk about it, they're, the biggest thing is education versus being a fiduciary. Mm. If you keep it really general and you do not customize that advice, then it's considered education. If it's something you can Google and find out, education. The moment you start talking about their circumstances, specifics, and, and again, customization has an interpretation tied to it. So again, where do you go? Oh, no, no, that was education versus a recommendation, recommendation equals fiduciary. Yeah. Is it worth splitting the hairs? Or, eh, you know what? If I'm going to talk about that money, I'm just going to, you know, my fan, my favorite definition they put is if you state you're a fiduciary, then you're a fiduciary. You're like, if you say it, if you say it, you, you are, are it. it. And I'm like, that's a door. I just cracked me up. I'm like, really? That's on the list? But it is. That's it should definitely detail. be on the list, though. Like, to <laughs> be <laughs> fair, like, if you say it, you need to now be, I mean, because the consumer has to believe it, right? I, They're not going to check into it. Speak into the universe. You're like, I am a fiduciary. No, but. The, it's really about the recommendation. And, and and because that is up for interpretation, I don't think it's worth the risk to not just... Yeah, I think, your I think that's fair. You know, you should assume if you're an advisor in the retirement planning space, which is what obviously this video is intended for, mm -hmm. it, you should assume under these new circumstances. It really is, you know, and I was going to kind of wait for the summary here, but it really is this new final rule seems to be like, you know what, we're going to give the power of, of, to the consumer mm -hmm. to include whoever they feel wrong them in the process. And, and so if you had any role in the recommendation of their retirement account, you're likely able to be named in this it gives the power to the consumer mm -hmm. to now or the investor to to say hey you know this guy here i wouldn't have always you know that the one-time loophole thing that was kind of a weird loophole they've yeah. closed that now they're saying the final the final rule closes the loophole for one-time advice and provides that such advice can be treated as fi fiduciary invi investment advice mm -hmm. If the conditions of investment advice fiduciary standard described above, blah, blah, blah. So they kind of said like, so if at all you found yourself in the, the broad description and you even talk about it one time. Mm -hmm. So it used to be it's like, okay, well, if you just made mention one time in passing and right. gave something, you would be able to just kind of be like, okay, yeah, you're not consistently giving advice to somebody. But you gave you made some one time mention of, hey, potentially this is a good option for you. Mm -hmm. You could get away with that to potentially as not being a fiduciary. Now, no. If you make any recommendation at all about somebody's ERISA, ERISA account and you are fiduciary, and you know obviously they're broadening that yeah. definition to include everyone, you're in that world. Oh, that's a really good one to, to remind folks because you were mentioning earlier, maybe I didn't expand on it, but that that's 30 years of experience doing it that way overnight to that one off that that one time communication is now considered f advice, which now throws you into the fiduciary. So, you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting shift, yeah. but I don't think from the last two years it's going to change much like the actionable items for folks to do here. You know, we don't wanna, we can talk about it all day long, but just the things to do to protect yourself are super simple and most advisors are already doing them. Yeah. Make some small tweaks. So we already talked about the PT 8424 form. Yeah. If your security's licensed, 202002, please keep in mind it does right. it there are different forms. Um and they're really again not drastically different per se, but you mentioned earlier if you have a broker dealer, you're already being held to a compliance standard. Yep. So make sure you're using that. There are some cases where you can pick the form. That's a thing we can talk about at a later date. If you have questions, call us. We can talk about the situation on that one. But yep. really, if you don't have a CRM to keep 
these forms. And again, I know this is super simple, so forgive me for those of you who have one, but you have to have these forms for six years. So if any time you're called up on to have that form, it needs to be readily available. So being super organized now is going to be your biggest advantage to dealing with it. God forbid anything pop up on an audit or a complaint. You talked about it now being more frequent annual, you know, inspections on a magnifying glass. So just be prepared. Um, the other thing I've been talking to folks about, I know people are going from one appointment to another. You're in the car, you're running, calling in for a quote. If you're not the best at taking notes on those phone calls with your clients or virtual appointments or in-person meetings, mm. you don't have a support staff, record it. Yeah. There are plenty of apps out there on your phone, on your landline, on the phone service you select, but it's not a disadvantage because you know that you are doing the right thing. So it's only going to lend support to you that you document and that you, you're not afraid of it's what you say to your client. evidence we all wish we had, yeah. Especially yeah. when I work on a complaint with an advisor, it's so frustrating hearing them say, but I, I did not say that and I know I showed them and we talked about it and then it's the him versus her game so you know he, advisors he said out there that use those for like uh chargeback scenarios liability yeah where they're you know hey you know that that's not what i said she's not missing you know and when they get to provide that letter of explanation they let they send a letter of explanation they wish they had that phone call mm -hmm. and they have i've helped people that have had the proof and i know i got a phone call from an advisor uh maybe two months ago that we we worked we talked through one and uh, he had the summary notes from every appointment. Uh, he had a recorded call of, and he had the dates and times he left voicemails trying to reach this person for delivery. Yeah. And so the client already submitted their complaint in writing. And here we had proof that about half of their claims were not only not true, but a little manipulative. And so it didn't become the he said, she said, it's here's proof of that I have a wonderful process and procedure, which leads me to... If you don't have a written procedure for how you run your office, write it down. It doesn't have to be anything extremely formal. It does have to be implemented. That's interesting. What do you do? How many appointments? What's your process? What's your general? How many follow-ups do you do? Add illustrations. A lot of folks concept sell Yeah. as they should. Sure. But make sure you run not one, a few illustrations. Show it to them and put it in their file along with that PT. Show your work. Show your work. Show oh, your work. beautiful. Every math teacher in America just got <laughs> real happy, you know. Didn't so no matter how you got to the answer. It actually, show, it. Show, <laughs> show your work. <laughs> but yeah, it's huge. I think, you know, huge thing for a lot of folks that are still doing that kneecap to kneecap sales internally. Maybe they don't use a cell, they're not calling people to give advice or doing their closing appointments. The majority of our industry still closing deals or bringing clients on in person. Yeah. How are you going to capture what was said in that meeting? I know a lot of advisors that will use like copy talk where they can just talk their notes out in every uh, a meeting. They make up a reason as to why they need to record every conversation is for their benefit and our benefit to make sure we document everything for future reference. It's very easy for you to make a reason uh, that, that benefits both parties. Uh, as to why you would record those in-person meetings as well. If you do Zoom meetings, Zoom automatically records those things along with providing really neat now transcripts of exactly what's happened. So an AI summary of what actually went on there, it's actually pretty accurate, which is interesting. Uh, so there's no reason in this day and age that every advisor, especially with this new scrutiny out there, is not recording what they're saying. And all the more reason for you to be boned up on your product knowledge, what you're selling, the work you've done to get to these conclusions, all very important things. Now, can I tell you the thing that I was probably most shocked to see? Please. Just reading through it. You know, I remember talking with our CEO about it a little bit mm -hmm. and, ta and, and making mention to him that, you know, hey, this is something really shocking to me and potentially puts a lot of folks in liability they never thought they'd be in. I want you to, I'm going to read this. One of the, the definitions of what is a recommendation. So I already established I'm a fiduciary in some way. Basically, we're all fiduciaries, so just assume that. So now we're all fiduciaries. I'm sitting down with a client, right? 
what they're saying is the management of securities is, could be considered a recommendation. Always has been. Right. Or other investment property, including, among other things, recommendations on investment policies or strategies, portfolio comp composition, and the selection of other persons to provide investment advice or investment management services. So if I'm sitting there, and I know there's a ton of insurance-only guys out there, I'm sitting there and I'm giving some advice on some situation that, you know, hey, you know, this is what, and I'm claiming to be a fiduciary. I'm a fiduciary, right? You know, and I'm helping them, and I'm going to fill out my, P I'm insurance-only, PTE 8424. I fill out my form. I disclose all that stuff. And then in the same right, I say, you know, this is what we're going to do with the insurance only money. But hey, I've got a guy that I know is great that's going to help you with the security side of it. And I work closely with them, referral or something like that. Sure. And they make a bad advice and they screw the client over or something like that. I can be named now in the lawsuit. I can be held liable. That's rough. A good attorney, a elder attorney, a sure. securities, or somebody else, and you refer your them over to somebody you trust and know does good work, and God forbid they make a misstep. They make a misstep. Wow. They're not documented. The client sues, wins that. They can name me as well, and you know how attorneys go. They're going to find all the money they can to put on that lawsuit. And so me, as we all need to be more careful. Now, does that mean that I will be found guilty? Maybe not. You know, if it's harmless and I don't really know this guy, whatever it might be. But I'm a fiduciary. I'm acting in my client's best interest. If I make a formal recommendation, I'm sure it's not like, hey, Lucy Goosey, I see you at the kid's soccer game. And I say, hey, you know, maybe you go check this guy out down the street. That's not really what they're saying. What they're saying is in a formal setting where you've directly got into the nitty gritty of who they are and what assets they have. And then you come out and say, hey, you know, I'm going to handle this for you. But this guy over here will, can help you do that. And then he makes a misstep, or she, and you're now put in a spot where you could be named. We got to be careful about who we're referring our business out to. And I don't know many folks that, um, you know, after that mention of the referral, also go and do some sort of due diligence or have some sort of legitimate partnership with their referral sources. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was probably the most shocking point to me in reading all this was like, oh, my goodness, mm -hmm. you know, this could be bad for so many people out there. Um, yeah, I know plenty of people that do it right now. If you are named, now you got to get an attorney, even if it's ridiculous, that's money, time. Now you might have to answer a question differently on your background for contract. And this is, have you ever been or named, named in a in, lawsuit? In a lawsuit? Yeah. Those aren't fun. And, you know, now technically you have to say yes. And now you have to write an explanation of well, this one time I referred over to a securities advisor. Turns out they were doing blank or she was doing blank, and now I have them in. I mean, it's just one more step. So It's been on the security side forever. I mean, yeah. you do see like those securities guys that were part of a broker-dealer or an RIA that did something bad, and they get named in the lawsuit, and they and then have to disclose all that stuff and yeah. blah, blah, blah. That but is intense, though. I mean, and suitability, that's the one other thing that's going to be a big shift if, if we can touch on that. It's a tool, though. I mean, everyone gets a little, uh, I don't know, a little cringy when they hear suitability, right? Kind of an eye roll. I know I'm doing the best thing for my client. Why do I feel like I have to prove this to the carrier? I want everyone to start viewing suitability as part of their defense. or And I don't want to say defense, like, but building it, like building a good castle, you know, like, you know, you're, you're, you stand your ground, you know what's up, and you're going to be solid. Yeah. But suitability really is going to be an amazing tool now because it is going to be your everyone's best friend where it went from your nightmare to to this is this is a good thing yeah. and i know if, i know people here are shaking their head no but it really is because now it's a chance for you to summarize all the work you are it's not about what you know you did it's about what you can show you did yes so if you can write really glowingly detailed even if it's just a short paragraph mm on how customized it was and what you took into consideration and proved you did to due diligence. Yeah. That alone is going to make every audit any carrier does a breeze. They're not going to have to call you. They're going to look at it and go, nice, and just move on. They're not going to ask clarifying questions or spend more time. And you'll be able to, you know, 
hold your head up high knowing not only did I know I did the right thing for my client, you. but you know I did the right thing for my client. Yeah. And you can leave me alone so I can go do something else with my time. Yeah. I, there's a lot to do with, and, and I'll leave, maybe we can kind of wrap up on this. Ooh. One of the things that, you know, really great uh, just business owner, sales strategist, Jeb Blunt says, is one of the most important things that a great salesperson or business owner can do is is they're all the quotients, the IQs, the the abilities for you, your intelligent quotient, uh, your 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 ability to communicate well. But one of the biggest things that he says that today's age business owner needs to be able to take advantage of is the technology quotient. Mm. Like how can you the best business owners, the people that do and survive in the end find ways to keep up with technology and find ways to use it to make them more efficient and effective. And right now, I see a lot of the top advisors in this industry taking notes to be compliant with all their record keeping, mm -hmm. taking quick notes, verbal communication, taking that verbal communication through a talk to text app of some kind, mm -hmm. and then taking the talk to text app and putting it through an AI aggregator that will allow it to then put a formal statement together for them. So you, you, you give that talk to text thing, you jibber jabber for the day, you know, all the things that just flow out of your head when you're done with your appointment. And then that jibber jabber gets put into a real formal communication through the power of technology that you can then file away and know that you've got your A, Bs, and Cs uh, taken care of. Beautiful. And that's fantastic. Technology. Why wouldn't we use it if we just, especially now, because it's all the headaches and, and most of us, if we're, you know, even keeping up semi with today's technology or using a CRM and putting notes in that CRM, this is just taking it one step further. And it doesn't have to be a huge headache where you sit down, take two hours to summarize your notes in a really formal way. Let technology do the heavy lifting for you, but make sure you're doing the small bit that's your responsibility. Um, you know, anything else we need to add to this? I mean, on that note, no, I think that is fantastic. I mean, we talked a lot about really simple, actionable items that everyone can walk away with, but I have to say that's probably the best one. And mm -hmm. obviously we have a great team that can help folks get familiar with these tools. Uh, I know, I know a few people on our team that sure. can help with that, but you know, it's one thing to not, don't, don't worry about it, folks. Yeah. That's one thing I want everyone to walk away with. The biggest shift is going to be the insurance carrier's responsibilities and what that looks like, but keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I just ask you, disclose, d document, and disclose, and you're good. And, and thank Leo, you for your time today. This was fantastic. I'm glad we did this. September 23rd, 2024, this all goes into effect. Lean on your business partners to help you through it all. We're here to help. Thank you guys for watching. If you made it this far, we appreciate you, and we'll see you next time.